at preventing COVID-19 infection. However, you are not fully protected until 10 to 14 days after receiving the second dose of the vaccine. Remember, the injection is given in the muscle of the upper arm. As part of the vaccination process, you will be observed for about 15 minutes just so a healthcare provider can monitor you for signs of an allergic reaction. Let's talk Vax Facts. Will I experience side effects from the second dose? Side effects are more common and may be more pronounced after the second dose of the vaccine. The most common side effects include a sore arm, fatigue, feeling tired, headache, aches and fever. Severe side effects are rare and treatable. What are the possible side effects from the COVID-19 vaccine? Side effects are normal and a sign that your body is building protection against a specific disease. The side effects experienced are usually mild to moderate and may last up to 72 hours. Common side effects may include swelling, tenderness, pain, warmth, itching or bruising where the injection is given tiredness or generally feeling unwell, chills or feeling feverish, headache, feeling sick or nauseous, joint pain or muscle ache, vomiting or diarrhea. Less common side effects include sleepiness or feeling dizzy, decreased appetite, enlarged lymph nodes or excessive sweating, itchy skin or rash. Seek medical attention immediately if after 72 hours of getting the vaccine, you feel faint or lightheaded, there are changes in your heartbeat, you develop shortness of breath, or you begin to wheeze, there is swelling of your lips, face, or throat, you have hives or rash, there's prolonged vomiting or diarrhea, or if you develop stomach pain. What do the side effects mean? If you get side effects, they're a good sign. They indicate that the vaccine is working by triggering the immune system. When you get the first shot, your immune system recognizes something as being foreign. The immune system automatically launches a small-scale attack against it. This process teaches your immune cells to recognize and respond to an invader. That's why you might experience some side effects. When you get the second shot, your immune system launches that attack again. But this time, there are more immune cells ready and waiting to launch a much bigger assault. That's why you may feel more side effects after the second dose, but they will disappear after a day or two. Think of it this way. The body's response to the vaccine is like a training mission for the real fight. Once you're fully vaccinated, if you were infected by the virus causing COVID-19, your immune system would be ready to launch an even larger and more powerful attack to protect you. If you don't experience any side effects from either the first or second dose, that doesn't mean that the vaccine didn't work. In the vaccine clinical trials, more than half of people didn't experience any side effects, but we still know that the vaccine was effective in those people. Is it possible to get COVID-19 even after the second dose? The chances of getting sick after vaccination are minimal. Studies show even if you develop COVID-19 after being vaccinated, you are unlikely to get severely ill. Flu vaccines are less effective than the COVID vaccines, but they can protect you from more severe flu illness and hospitalization. The COVID-19 vaccines are even more powerful. The efficacy of the vaccines in the prevention of severe COVID-19 is almost 100%. After taking the vaccine, it is still important to wear your mask. Always ensure that your mask is covering your nose and mouth. Maintain physical distance. Wash your hands with soap and water frequently. If you're not able to wash your hands, always use a hand sanitizer. For more information about the COVID-19 vaccine, visit www.moh.gov.jm or contact 888-1LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. Follow us on social media at the MOHWGOVJM. Hashtag get vaccinated. Hashtag get back to life.
The following is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. When your turn comes for the vaccine, please take the vaccine. It is absolutely important for those who have hesitancy and fear and all of that is legitimate it's healthy but i believe we have seen the vaccine at work we know what the risks are there are no risk less activities in life we urge you to participate in the national program and get vaccinated the proceeding was brought to you by the office of the prime minister We don't have any vaccine trials yet where we used the first dose, one brand of vaccine, and the second dose, a different brand of vaccine. But right now, they are beginning to do trials in the UK and elsewhere to look whether you can combine one vaccine with another. Now, many experts in the field believe that interestingly enough, your immunity might even be stronger if you get one vaccine with the first dose and a different one with the second dose. But we can't really say that yet because we don't have the data from the trials that they're putting in place to look at this. So at this point we are saying if you get the AstraZeneca, wait your 8 to 12 weeks and get the second dose with AstraZeneca. If you get one of the messenger RNAs, then four weeks, you get your second dose. If it's Johnson & Johnson, one dose. Booking your COVID-19 vaccination appointment is simple. Use one of two options. Option one, register using the online portal at the Ministry of Health and Wellness's website. Go to www.moh.gov.jm, click apply here for COVID-19 vaccinations, and follow the instructions on screen. Enter your mobile phone number. You will receive a text message with a one-time password. Enter it on the site to confirm your account. Fill in the information requested. Choose your parish and a vaccination center there, then schedule a date and time convenient to you. You will receive a text confirmation with the details of your appointment. Option 2. You may also book your vaccination appointment via telephone. Call the National Vaccination Center at 888-1-LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. A representative will take your information, book you at the nearest vaccination site, and register your appointment. You now have a vaccination appointment. For your first dose, when going to the site, take your TRN and a government-issued identification or letter from a Justice of the Peace. For your second dose, take to the appointment your vaccination card, TRN and a government-issued identification or letter from a Justice of the Peace. You may ask a relative or friend to help you book your vaccination appointment. Book your COVID-19 vaccination appointment today. Get vaccinated. Get back to life. Bartending for me really is a hobby that just became a profession. I'm now at a level where I'm putting meats to your drink. So yes, if I need to cook a drink for you, that's, that's more than possible. I'm the bar supervisor here at the Rock House Hotel and Pushkar Rum Bar. To be a culinary cocktail artist means that I would be using culinary technique in order to make a cocktail. Tourism has definitely been the vehicle that's funded my professional development and growth that I've seen where I've grown from polishing silverware to where I'm now running a whole beverage program. It's what I use to take care of my family, basically build my house. Everything I do is my job, what I do here. Tourism is definitely working for me and tourism is working for you. No one is immune to mental illness, your age, race, gender, social class, or economic status is no match for addictive behaviors, anxiety, or eating disorders, depression, or schizophrenia. What is, is having a good social support system. As the saying goes, in times of test, family is best. Unfortunately, many are denied the benefit of the support of family and friends because of stigma and an oppressive silence around mental illness. Let's put an end to the silence. Speak up. Speak now. End the stigma. Share your story. End the stigma. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness.
Jamaica, home of the resilient, passionate and hardworking. A people and a nation who have achieved and defied all odds, working to keep their economy growing, their country thriving from investments made in innovative opportunities and exports demanded globally. We have a vision now within our grasp where Jamaica becomes the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. We will not let go of this vision. We will grow. We will overcome these challenging times and look to the future with hope and positivity. These are special times. The world as we know it has changed, but home will always be in our hearts. And in Jamaica, you can always find a home. Think you know Jamaica? Look again. You will be surprised. We are advising persons <clears throat> that if they have had COVID, the disease, and it has been confirmed with a PCR or antigen test, then they do not need to take the vaccine until perhaps four to six months after they got the disease. Then they could take one dose of the vaccine Stephen, and good evening to my colleagues. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another COVID conversation. I want to begin on a, on a solemn note um, on behalf of the public health fraternity, the staff at the Percy Junior Hospital, and indeed all of Jamaica, in expressing our condolences to the family members, the friends of Nurse Annette White Best, 40 years old, a uh, practicing nurse at the Percy Junior Hospital who sadly passed uh, very recently um, as a result of infection and complications from the COVID virus. Um, we, uh, we, we, we mourn with her family members, with the, her family and friends, with the staff at the Percy Junior Hospital, and indeed the entire uh, health and public health fraternity uh, her passing is uh, very regrettable, clearly, and, you know, at such a young age. But, you know, she was on the front line, uh, giving all the efforts, the commitment, the dedication to fighting COVID, to saving lives, and we honor her and her memory for that contribution. It is also quite instructive uh, should be anyway to all of us to recognize and appreciate once again the risks that our public health workers on the front line place themselves in as they seek to provide the necessary support, the expertise, uh, the commitment to service to the population. And it's so important for us to always remind ourselves of that and to uh, recognize them, encourage them, motivate them uh, as they seek to do their jobs. It's, it's, a, it's a hazard of the job, and we always fear this worst outcome. So again, I say on behalf of the team here, our condolences to uh, Nurse uh, White Best on this very tragic uh, situation. Today we are going to be discussing uh, a number of issues around the COVID response. Uh, some of those have been ventilated, or at least a discussion has begun. Uh, issues around our current state of hospitals, and the, the CMO will deal with that. But also, very importantly, issues around the vaccination uh, efforts. And those efforts, uh, as I had said earlier, we're pivoting on to look at additional ways to get vaccines out into the communities, to the population, given that we no longer have a vaccine supply issue. It's now to generate the demand and the take-up, and it does require 
all of us to play our part in getting this done. Uh, as I have said before, and I'll say again, it's so important that we see the vaccine as an important step to pushing back the COVID threat. Every vaccine counts, and everyone who qualify should go out and get the vaccine uh, to protect themselves, their families, and indeed the collective, the community, and the country. Every single vaccine counts, and every vulnerable person represents a risk to all of us if they either don't take the vaccine or still uh, ignore having taken the vaccine, the other measures around mask wearing, sanitizing, and physical distancing. So we're going to go into some details on that, but for now, I want to just turn over the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Bisesa mckenzie to give the surveillance update. Good evening, Minister, and good evening, colleagues, and everybody in the audience. So our update is the situation as at the data as at the 11th of August, which was yesterday. So yesterday we would have confirmed a total of 375 new cases, which would have given us a daily positivity rate of 31.7%. And that makes our seven day average 33.4%. We have a total of over 56,000 um, confirmed cases 1,268 deaths, or case fatality rate is at 2.3%. Um, in terms of our admissions to hospitals right across the country, we have been seeing an increase in the number of admissions on a daily basis. And the slide that is there shows in the pink line the average admissions per day. And we can see that the, the last point there is at just above 70 admissions per day, and we can see that that is past our peak that we had in April, May, in March, April, when we had our last surge. So if the, if the number of admissions are going up, then of course the number of hospitalizations are going to be increased. So let us look at the next slide that looks at the bed occupancy. And we can see now, compared to last week, that our bed occupancy now is at over 600 beds occupied with both confirmed cases and suspected cases. The daily reports only look at the confirmed cases, and that is why you will see a discrepancy between the numbers that we're reporting now. Now we're reporting the total bed occupancy, which is both confirmed and suspected cases of COVID. And our peak, March, April, we were at just over 700, and now we are just over 600. So we're fast approaching that peak, which would put us in a very dangerous zone in terms of the threat to um, the, the care for COVID patients in our hospitals. Next slide. And you can see if at the zoning that it puts us in a very high level of pressure on the hospital system when we have this amount of beds that are being occupied by COVID suspected or confirmed cases. In terms of our positivity rate, again, if we compare um, with the previous peak in March, April, you can see that we are just about there. The daily positivity is represented in the white and the seven day average in the pink and the 14 day average in the blue lines. And you can see that in terms of the seven day average, we have actually um, almost reached to the where we were in March, April last, earlier on in this year. So our positivity rate is dangerously high. Next. And here you can see that it is in the red zone, very high level of transmission presently occurring in the country. Next slide. Just to look at our overall indicators in terms of geographical spread, we are now in a situation where 50 to 75 percent of communities are being affected with newly confirmed cases widespread across the country. We're seeing in terms of bed occupancy, our hospitals are under extremely high pressure as we very, very quickly are approaching 
um, or capacity for COVID management, and therefore that will spill over into our general occupancy. In terms of positivity, we have jumped. We are over 30% um, at a very high transmission level in country. Our reproductive rate remains at about 1.3, which means that as the numbers go up, more and more persons are being exposed and becoming infected. And our vaccination rate is still at a low level that it would have low effects on transmission. So that's a summary of our indicators, Mr. Thank you very much, um, CMO. Uh, <clears throat> I think we, we say this almost daily. We put the, the, meet, the, the information out and we emphasize the numbers to watch as an indication of the challenges that we face that the health system faces, that individuals who have the virus face, and uh, the entire you know, e ecosystem of how the country operates is impacted by those numbers. 600 beds uh, represents a rapidly increasing number of occupying of the COVID beds, the 700 plus beds, which means there is very little room and we have to take this very seriously in terms of the control. I've been to a few institutions in the last day, a few days, the University Hospital, for example, and uh, the 577 beds, those beds were all taken certainly a day and a half ago when I was there and persons waiting. So it is a very serious situation that we must all take very seriously. The reproductive rate of 1.3% means that we're infecting at a rate that continues to increase and increase exponentially because we are over the one um, mark. Remember, we want to keep it below one. So that's a challenge. And of course, the positivity rate of about 30% averaging um, over, what, three days? 70 average. 70 average, 30% is extremely high given that the ideal scenario is to keep it below 5%. So, you know, it's impatient of debate as to where we are. We are in the third wave. We did say it was likely that we would get there based on all the critical parameters and that we, it was up to us in terms of some of the things we did. We did, as a government, now relax some measures because of other considerations. And as a consequence, uh, I think, and all the other factors, we are where we are. It is a risk to us as individuals, as community, as economy, and as country. And it's up to all of us to action a response. So we have pivoted and adjusted, if you will, the approach to dealing with the third wave. And the CMO has spoken to the statistics. And the hospital response is fundamental to that. And it is a stressful situation. But we are doing the best we can. The, the many men and women out there in the field, uh, in the hospital system, providing appropriate treatment. And we cannot thank them enough for the work that they are doing. They are truly the heroes of, um, of this, this decade and, and perhaps um, the century, given that this is a once in a 100 year occurrence. And it's tough. It's very difficult for them. In the meantime, though, we have to uh, operate on a parallel track to deal with the mitigating measures, vaccination being key to addressing the, con the, 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 the threat of the virus. And so we have made some adjustments. In the past, we would do the blitz sites, the significant sites in main town centers. We would move people to those sites. And then there were some uh, selected fixed sites, health centers primarily, that would offer vaccines. We're adding to the fixed sites and the blitz sites mobile uh, setup in different parts of the country that will take the inoculation uh, program, the vaccination program, to locations, population centers in a sense, off the beaten track, in communities, closer to the people, in com uh, to mobilize as best as possible 
persons who otherwise would have to travel uh, distances to get the vaccines. And we're doing so for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is to make it a lot easier to access the vaccines. But very importantly, it is also to engage the community-based approach to overcoming and, and, and supporting a, level, a comfort level for persons who may have issues with the vaccine. Um, engage in one-on-one, hand-to-hand combat, if you will, maybe not the right terminology, but really addressing some of the concerns that people have. So the communication strategy is very much uh, intertwined with the logistics of taking the program to communities. In other words, our church leaders, um, our, our, our uh, civil society leaders, the youth club organizations, the, the police, the, the, the public health officers, of course, uh, the MPs and councillors, we anticipate and expect to be a part of the process that would allow the community-based mobilization. And in that mobilization, we have some convincing to do. And, and that is to talk to persons who either don't know, don't understand, or need some reassurances. And so the program is to fix an approach that will uh, combine the communication approach with the, the, the location approach at the community level. So while we, we have piloted, as I said uh, some time ago last week, two such interventions, uh, West Central, St. Catherine, where we did some just under 1,000 um, vaccinations last week, Wednesday, that happens to be my constituency, and uh, some may accuse me of uh, providing preferential um, treatment. But it was a pilot, and I wanted to see exactly what were the issues that would either enhance or support the, the program. And I, I really want to thank those who came out and those who helped with the mobilization. And it was truly a community-based approach. We sent in the town criers a couple of days before. We uh, empowered persons in the communities on the ground, either with flyers or to visit others and to inquire those who may not be easily mobile and would need some support. We hired some vehicles to move those persons around. And uh, on the day, it, it represented a sort of community-based approach to bringing people out, um, getting them inoculated, taking those who we needed to help back home. And, and it worked. I think it worked. So that's what we are hoping to happen with the community-based approach. We also did uh, a mobile pop-up at the Sovereign Center here in Kingston, the Ligonier area. We did 661 persons. And yes, it started off a little rocky because, frankly speaking, more persons turned up than we had thought. But it was a pilot. And we quickly adjusted. But that's a good number. And so we know that it is workable. And we want to do more of it, and we'll be doing more of it uh, uh, in the days to, and weeks to come. Up to 3 p.m. today, we had vaccinated over some 391,076 persons, 255,961 first dose, 134,186 second dose, and 929 single doses. Um, our target, of course, is to administer some 700 I'm assuming the 929 is the G&J, Johnson & Johnson single dose. Our target is to administer some 700,000 doses of the vaccine by the end of September, which would, which in pursuit of this 65% of population by March 2022. It's an ambitious target. It's not a target that will fail on account of a lack of vaccines. It's a target. If it fails, it would fail on the account of the take-up of vaccines, which is why the approach around community-based intervention is important. To do so, it's so important for us to engage the community. And so it's the community engagement plan that is to take us through the identification and setup of the various sites through the sensitization and implementation so the regional authorities have been tasks, and I've, I had a meeting with parish managers today, with communicating with leadership in the respective communities, bring their public health knowledge and field operation uh, 
to experience, to determine on sites, not sites that suit us in implementing because it's convenient, sites that are close to the people and can provide the support of the entire community to mobilize, to overcome objections, and to bring the people out. Uh, these, 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 um, this approach is captured under a sort of participatory uh, theme, relying on multiple stakeholders. And so our members of parliament, councillors, um, community health aides, we have hired a thousand of those, health promotion and education officers, community leaders, private partners and church leaders, um, we are relying on those stakeholders to be a part of this approach. And the sensitization has already begun on the political front. Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, Minister McKenzie, indeed the Prime Minister, he and I had a town hall today um, uh, zooming into the diaspora and throughout the country. He himself has committed to being on the road and also to be mobilizing his, his, his members. Um, I should say too, and I know he won't mind, that I am meeting uh, tomorrow Friday, uh, that's the, 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 we have agreed, with the opposition spokesman on health, uh, MP Morris Guy, and I intend to have a discussion with him on levels of collaboration that could be necessary or would be worthwhile, uh, where he and I can share some ideas, and to the extent that we can agree, which I'm sure we can, because I believe he's, his intentions are sincere, we will coordinate, collaborate, and work together so that we, we, we do all is necessary to eliminate any perception that these efforts are in any way color-coded by party political lines. This is a national effort intended to mobilize and to save a country. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that he has agreed to that, to that meeting, and we hope that that will happen uh, sometime tomorrow. The, the plan, as I said, will, uh, has been activated this week. We have been in a number of areas and making, and, and we've started the process and it will go further. And a, part of, a key part of it is the communication strategy on the ground as opposed to the communication strategy in the air. In the meantime, it's important for persons to note that we are going to have fixed sites. So while we will have the pop-up or community sites, we want to have fixed sites so whenever someone in a parish wants to be inoculated, vaccinated, there is no community operation in their community. They can go to a fixed site that will always be there and benefit from uh, the vaccines. And the following sites would be fixed sites. Uh, Kingston and St. Andrew, it would be St. Joseph's Hospital, Mona Aging and Wellness Center, the University Hospital of the West Indies. In St. Catherine, it will be St. Jago Park Health Center. St. Thomas, it will be Moran Bay Health. St. James, Catherine Hall, Sandals Inn, and the Type 5 Health Center. Hanover, it will be Lucy Health Center. Westmoreland, uh, Sablamar Health Center. Manchester, it will be Mandible Hospital. Mandible Health Center. Christiana Health Center. Porous Health Center and Newport Health Center. Clarendon, it will be Summerfield Community Centre, Maypen Hospital, Lionel Town Health Centre, Spaldings, Frankfield, and Thompson Town. In St. Elizabeth, it will be Black River Health Centre, Santa Cruz Health Centre, Junction Health Centre, Southfield Health Centre, Magotti and Balaclava Health Centres. Uh, <clears throat> now, there may be some time difference depending on the fixed sites. And I don't have the times here. A lot of these are between, you have the times? We'll share the times on social media. But I know, for example, St. Diego, it is between 4 and 7. So, um, you know, it, there are other things that have to be done. There are health clinics, you know, chronic illnesses. You know, persons have to get their medication. There are monthly or, uh, you know, twice a month checkup. We can't leave those cases out there, but priority is given to vaccination. So get the time that vaccines are administered at these fixed sites. In addition to the fixed sites and our community activations, we will continue with our vaccination blitz. And we're all aware of the blitz that we have had in the past. 
And this weekend, we intend to have the following. Saturday, August 14th, uh, we will have in the Serra, St. Catherine, we'll have St. Diego Park Health Center and the Portmore Heart Academy. St. Thomas, we will have the Jung Supermarket, Moran Bay Square, Moran Bay Health Center, and Seaford Health Center. In the KC, Maxfield Park Health Center. In St. Mary, the St. Mary Anglican Church. In Portland, it's the Buff Bay Health Center. St. Anne Belair Farms Market. Clarendon, Denby Primary School, and Spalding Health Center. St. Elizabeth Barbary Hall Community Center, Santa Cruz Health Center, Black River Health Center, and Junction Health Center. In Mandeville, Man Mandeville Regional Hospital. In St. James, the Sandals Inn and the Type 5 Health Center. Hanover, Lucy Health Center. And Westmoreland, I see here, no blitz this weekend. Um, we will keep you informed on that. I'll check on that because I don't think... I think we need to have a place there on Saturday in West Milan, um, but I'll, I'll keep you informed on that. As it relates to Sunday, we will be at the National Arena um, in St. Anne, the Bel Air Farm, Farmers Market, Clarendon, Denby Primary School, and Manchester Mandeville Regional Hospital. That's on Sunday of this week. So we are active across the country with our regular blitz operation this Saturday and Sunday, and we urge persons to go out to get vaccinated. If you can't get an appointment online or through the phone lines, go to the site. Now, we prefer the appointment, but don't let a lack of appointment stop you. We want everyone to come out, and our team on the ground is making the sacrifice and are able, willing, and will be there to serve you all. We're also counting on our media partners to support the effort by providing persons with accurate and timely information about the available vaccines and vaccinations. Um, you know, there are so many myths, half-truths, rumors, speculation, uh, mischief that is out there around vaccines. And it's, it's really sad. And it's sad because, for starters, most Jamaicans, adult Jamaicans, have had one form of vaccine or another during their lifetime. It is a requirement to go to the public school system. And if you look, as I've said over and over, in, on one of your shoulders here, you'll probably see a scar when it was a little more challenging. Maybe the needles were a little bigger. Uh, when, as a child, before you went into school, you had to do the vaccines. I have it right here, and I've shown it a few times. And so, you know, this idea that somehow the COVID vaccine is a novel and dangerous concept or idea or treatment is just plain wrong. The difference between then and now is that we have a burst of access to information because of technology, social media, and everybody is a star. Everybody is able with a phone to make a statement, to draw conclusions, to pronounce and that's all right so to do in this very free society that we live in. But frankly speaking, some of those comments are downright irresponsible and indeed mischievous because the science does not support some of the conclusions that are being drawn. It's anecdotal, it's made up, and it is damaging not just to individuals but to the society on a whole. And I want to categorically say we need the support of all well-thinking Jamaicans, those who have influence, those who have the power of the pen, those who have the pulpit to preach on, those who have the, the gym that, where they give instructions, or the police youth clubs, or the, you know, whoever you are in your own sphere of influence, do the right thing, see it as your civic duty to advance the cause of taking up the vaccine for the benefit of the country. The vaccine does not have a chip. We're not trying to track people's daily living. Indeed, your phone does that more than any, anything else, and you all have a phone. Um, there is no mark of the beast in the vaccine. It's not the live virus that is being put inside of you. And I could go on and on. It is in your interest it is in your protection. 
and there's a doctor on hand or a nurse to give you the health guidelines. And that's why we need the community approach to be out there and to support this. So we're counting on the media to give us support. The private sector, I want to say, is a part of the holistic approach. And I want to commend them for continuing give to us with the support uh, they have indicated the private sector through the private sector vaccine initiative that they have committed to activating a fixed site in Kingston beginning next week with a target to vaccinate some 6,000 persons each week. It's a great start and I know we will, they'll build from that and essentially what that means we have a public health member that's there to support them. They bring in their doctors, they get access to the vaccines, we record the information on the central database, provide the same confidentiality but they man those centers. And that was always in the plan. Now that we are in full uh, uh, flight to get as many vaccinated as possible, private sector is now advancing that. The Girl Guides headquarters here in Kingston has been a fixed site for the private sector initiative. Additionally, two mobile sites are being put in place, and the intention is to use these mobile sites, and I think it's a great idea, great concept, to visit companies and more than 350 employees who have signaled their intention so far to be vaccinated. And so what they're doing, uh, which we are encouraging, is use the mobile sites to go to a work, a place of work in whatever industry, sector, uh, provide the information to workers and provide the opportunity for those workers to benefit from the vaccine, set up in a way that is follows the appropriate protocols, as we would have done at a pop-up site in a community. And so we look forward to that, and we certainly look forward to the expansion of that, because we do need all hands on deck. The, we will also, uh, on another uh, note, uh, begin to look at how we can motivate and incentivize the population as it relates to the vaccine initiative. Uh, I've been having some discussions with the team and with uh, external stakeholders. We do have uh, a foundation, the Health and Wellness Foundation in the ministry, and uh, that Health and Wellness Foundation has been charged, uh, led by Mr. Courtney Cephas, to reach out to traditional partners in the private sector uh, and to see how we can work out incentivizing take up of the vaccines. Now, you would have heard in some countries where persons are given money and land and fast food and, you know, quick service meal tickets and all that. Um, the principle is similar. We don't have any money or land to give, but we do think that some private sector companies can offer a, a voucher towards you know, uh, purchasing their next, you know, your next weekly grocery, a voucher that may go towards fueling a car, you know, gas voucher, whatever that, you know. And we're speaking to a few companies who have expressed an interest in that. Uh, I, I normally don't do this, but I'm using the opportunity to encourage companies who see the restoration of economic activity as essential and the health of the country as critical to the health of their business to define a role for yourself, not just to commit to getting your employees to take the vaccine, but also importantly, where you can, uh, be a part of this incentivization. For starters, give your workers time off to go and get the vaccines. I mean, I, 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 I get calls sometimes quarreling or protesting the fact that the centers are not open beyond a certain time, and why we won't we adjust the time. And I agree that we do, and we do that sometimes. We go up to 8 o'clock and so on. But, you know, employers consider staggering some hours, work hours, allowing your employees to take the time, having convinced them to take the vaccine where they are doubtful, and allow them to go and take it. Maybe provide the Panadol for them to take after they get the vaccine, which we recommend. And certainly, to the extent that you can incentivize further with a gift voucher, um, do it. I mean, we encourage you to do it. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't have to go that far, but to my mind, if it's, 
if it will help the process, it will serve the greater good. And so the Health and Wellness Health for Life Foundation will be working on that. Mr. Cephas can be reached at cephasc at moh.gov.jm. Stephen, I thought you would have that on the screen. Um, in any event, you can go via our website and, and make contact or send to me or the PSCMO will forward if you have an idea of incentivizing as long as that idea ultimately means getting more persons out to get the vaccination. Uh, we will comment more on those that we are partnering with when we finalize the agreements, and those are likely to be more focused at the community interventions, going into the community and getting community persons out. In terms of vaccine supplies, um, I, the, we have... We, we have the vaccines. We have vaccines in stock, the AstraZeneca vaccine currently on Ireland. Uh, but I have seen in the media where it has been carried, so it's, it's not new news anymore, uh, given the pace of, 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 of the new cycle. But we can confirm that next Tuesday, we, will, we are expected to receive our first batch of Pfizer vaccines, uh, which will come into the island. And uh, we are expecting overall some uh, 608,000 doses of that particular brand. However, the first shipment will be just over 200,000 doses. So the Pfizer vaccine will come in and, uh, and uh, will arrive Tuesday, uh, August 17, 2021. The I want to just use the opportunity, of course, to recognize the efforts of all who have been part of this process, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Minister Johnson Smith leading that charge, um, obviously the Honorable Prime Minister um, and the health team that have given support. Um, but we are now seeing the arrival of additional brands. And uh, we did say that it would happen in August. We would see more coming in. and. It's, it's playing true to form. So vaccines are coming. Vaccines are here. Vaccines in abundance. It's now time to get persons to take that up. The, the, the ministry will begin the utilization of these vaccines on Monday, August 23rd at all our vaccination sites. So there is a process, and we are managing that process. So we don't want person to say, I know there are some preferences for particular brands. We are not going to place a lot of emphasis on that. However, just to say that the brands will be available throughout the system across the country, but are unlikely in this instance to be available until the 23rd of August. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine has been proven, as you know, to be safe and approved for use in children and adolescents. And the prioritization of children is, is for us critical at this juncture. And uh, in this context, the, 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 it, there is going to be some prioritization and adjustment towards a younger population using that particular brand. And that's because the research has been done, the clinical assessment has been done, and as you know, we go, we go by what the science suggest or proves and therefore the Pfizer vaccine I know persons have been asking will now be available to uh, a younger age cohort that is 12 and over uh, if you particularly if they, there are challenges with your you know health status and certainly 15 and over for sure um, and there are some special programs that we are planning that will involve um, pulling both child and parent out at a location um, to provide that vaccine. And we'll comment more, more uh, on that. The, so we will focus on 15 years and older with parental consent, as well as children 12 years and older with comorbid conditions. And that's for the Pfizer vaccine. As part of the government's mandate, to prioritize education and the reopening of schools for face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, the ministry also will now finalize discussions with the Ministry of Education 
youth and information on the ways in which students 15 years and older, especially those who will be sitting exit examinations, can be facilitated for early vaccination. Um, and uh, this is going to be very important. So we have been pitching vaccine take up for our teachers. We're now, we will now have an opportunity to pitch and strategize and encourage vaccine take up for our students, or at least a, a fairly large segment of our student population. And that double approach will, I believe, enhance fairly significantly protection in the classroom. And that's a good thing. And so we encourage our parents and our young people to be a part of this process as we give uh, specific details um, in the week to come. I am also pleased to announce that through our negotiations with the African Medical Supply Platform, we are expected to receive um, in the next, over the next week uh, approximately 118,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Um, so that's another brand. This is a single-dose brand, Johnson & Johnson, and these doses will be administered at all vaccination sites, again beginning August 23rd. 2021. So we will also have another brand. Now, we expect that the J&J &J will, we will have another shipment a week after the first shipment or thereabouts. And then next month, we will have a bigger shipment of the Johnson & Johnson um, uh, vaccines. The, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, as we have said, are vaccines that we're paying for we have booked and have paid down on approximately 1.9 million doses of that vac those vaccines to be delivered over a period of time. So this would represent the first tranche of uh, the, the contract that we have with the manufacturer and supplier. And uh, while it will be available across the board, across the country, we will prioritize certain groups based on the challenges perceived with the second dose logistics of getting the full coverage from the vaccine. And so there are some groups, you know, street people, vulnerable groups, um, the, even in the case of the community activations where it may be difficult to go back a second time because we have mileage to cover and it's logistically challenging. It may be best to give persons the single dose to get full coverage and complete that transaction or that process. And so some of that will take place as we uh, pan out and offer the, the vaccines. To become vaccinated, members of the public are encouraged to make their appointments online. As we have said, the www.moh.gov.jm or call the vaccination center at 888-1-LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. But don't let that stop you from going to a center where vaccines are being administered. Once persons have received their appointment, they are to visit their vaccination site on time, take their TRN and government-issued identification or letter from a JP. And uh, um, our mobile sites, no appointment is required. So don't, don't be hindered when you hear we're popping up somewhere um, because you can come in and fill out necessary information. Um, but it, would be, it will be useful, and indeed we require you to have a government identification on you in order to capture the information and log it. Members of the public are continued, we encourage to stay vigilant in terms of their infection prevention control um, because even with the vaccine, you still need to wear the mask. You can still pick up the virus and transmit the virus. And we have seen some cases like that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a road we're traveling until we get the herd immunity that we're looking for. As part of the efforts to ensure that Jamaicans have the information that they need to feel comfortable to become vaccinated, we want to present to you this evening our new vaccination website. Uh, are you going to bring that up, Stephen? Uh, we now have a website which is um, vaccination.moh.gov.jm. And let's see if it comes up. Uh, and so we encourage those who are sufficiently techno-savvy 
there you go, to visit that site, get information, and use that information as necessary to overcome any objections, challenges, concerns, or queries. I believe it's an interactive site, so you can pose questions if you need to, and the site is supported by a number of stakeholders, our own technical team, but we partner, of course, with the WHO, with PAHO, and others. It also gives basic data on the status of our vaccination program. Very important, let's even go back to that site about MITS. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a, you do, okay, fine. So when you visit, you will see the, vac, the myths, um, the, the frequently expressed concerns, some of which I, I spoke to earlier. Now, we appreciate that it also gives information on the vaccines and their, you know, all the necessary information that you may want to know about. We appreciate that not everyone will visit a website. And indeed, some may be even intimidated by a website. But we also know that a lot of Jamaicans are sufficiently informed, curious, and technologically capable to log on to a website, whether on their phone device, their smartphone, or their laptops or desktops. We are asking those who can to visit, gather the information from the site, and see it as part of your civic duty to relate that information to persons who you know can't. So every community has someone who knows how to go on a website. Every community in Jamaica. And I'm sure it's not the minority of persons in some instances. But even if it is, there is an opinion leader who may have concerns about the vaccine program. Visit the site, pull down the information, print it if you can, or log it, go to the church and engage a conversation. Go to the bars, if that's your place of relaxation, engage in a conversation. Go to the youth club, engage in a conversation. This is a national mobilization program. And what the site is there to do is to provide information. It's not there to convince everybody. It's to provide information to those who can access it. And we're appealing and asking to those who can access to use that information to convince those who can't. See the site as a tool of information to overcome myths, to provide data, to provide facts and figures, and most importantly, to mobilize the population. I want to commend the team who have put the site together uh, for their hard work. Uh, it's, uh, it's always a work in progress, so we will add as we go along. But I think this is a very important addition, and I want to say thanks to them. Um, and I think I've spoken enough, but there was a lot to say today. So I'm going to hand over now to Stephen for his uh, the question and answer session. Stephen. Thank you very much, Minister. So reminding our media colleagues to use the raise hand feature on Zoom to pose their questions and just wait. would, as a policy, uh, provide some levels of um, oversight over um, activities within that geographic space. So from that perspective, the, the health, uh, public health team would be, in the first instance, aware. In the second instance, would have some sort of uh, ability or authority 
to determine if protocols are followed and would also have the authority, if they are not, to report um, on, on that. Now, we work closely with um, local government, uh, you know, that provides permits for usage at locations and so on, and they do their own monitoring. So it's not just a health issue. We work closely with the constabulary in terms of enforcement because we don't detain people. Um, and, uh, you know, other groups, and in this case, given the unusual nature of restrictions, you know, the Disaster Risk Management Act and the lifting or relaxation um, of, in this instance, the entertainment industry, we would also have worked with the entertainment ministry on, on some of these events that were given permi permits to operate by providing the protocols and depending on those agencies to assist in some of the monitoring and enforcement. So we, we, we have to play a role. We would play a role normally. And in these extraordinary circumstances, we clearly would uh, be there on the ground, the local team. However, um, enforcement uh, permits and those things are done by other agencies. So it's a collaborative effort. Not me to shut down the park from the very day. It was noted that all the COVID rules were not in I didn't hear. I didn't hear the question. Sorry. I'm asking you if you can say why a recommendation was not made to shut down the party after it was recognized on day one that all the rules were not being obeyed in respect of COVID protocol. Right. So, so you ask a loaded question. For starters, you you have assumed that all the rules were not being obeyed. I don't know that. I haven't seen a report that that was the case. Um, I am not saying they were or were not. Um, you know, the, the truth is there is an assumption from public health's perspective anyway that it is difficult to enforce in totality rules of engagement where you have um, excess numbers or numbers beyond a certain point, where you have alcohol involved and, 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 you know, the spirit of one form or the other. And uh, frankly speaking, it, it would always have been difficult. And, and I'm being very frank in, in, in saying so. It, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy, it, it, it would not have been an easy challenge. A lot would have depended on the organizers to put protocols in place. And pre-event, those protocols our infrastructure would have been examined and comments made um, if they needed to be strengthened or improved. And then the monitoring would serve also to, 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 to advise during event if things were happening that were untoward. But th the truth is, uh, Damien, we don't have the personnel to, to provide that level of close scrutiny and monitoring um, in these circumstances. And, and I want to say something else because, you know, I, I hold no brief for Dream Weekend. I mean, I wasn't there. And I, you know, obviously it has a big following. It's a strong brand. And under normal circumstances, they do well. And credit to the creativity of those who have created this concept. But the reality is that there are many other events um, that were not as strong in terms of the brand, but took place during a period of relaxation that would have been impossible to, 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 to enforce or to oversee because you don't have enough policemen to do it. You don't have enough, you know, um, persons working with local government who are out looking at these events to... And many are without permits, so you don't even know that they are taking place until after the fact. I believe Minister Mackenzie gave a percentage of what they found to be in compliance, and these were the events that had permits, and there were several, I'm sure, that did not have. So the point I'm making is there is always a very 
great risk when you have these, this, this environment for persons to not comply. And you depend on compliance, self-monitoring and self-compliance, because you can't enforce. Um, and uh, what we saw in some of the clips that were clearly public and being circulated is that you know, some of your worst fears were realized in that persons engaged in activities that would have created a greater risk for the virus to spread. And that's, that's the reality. Hence the question, Minister. I'm not quite sure whether you answered the question as to why a recommendation was not made from the very outset. It was recognized that the rules were not obeyed. Well, I, I, I can't give you the answer that you're wanting me to give or looking for. The, the point I'm making is it's a nuanced scenario and context. The fact is, I am not assuming that the, the protocols were not followed in all instances. And I'm not assuming that it was followed in all instances at a particular event. I am sure there were breaches periodically in some events, and maybe all the time in some events. Some were legal, some were illegal. To the extent that we encountered events where we had the authority to comment on, I'm sure the public health team would have. But I, I think it's important not to burden the public health team with that overarching responsibility of enforcing uh, those protocols, or indeed even other agencies, because if persons decide not to follow, it becomes very difficult for that kind of enforcement to take place, which is why we are, we are back where we are in terms of some of those restrictions, because when the restrictions are in place, as negatively impacting as they are on livelihood and activities, and entertainment in this case, it does offer a better chance of working, and by extension, controlling the virus, which we are now experiencing as spreading. Thank you very much, Minister. We're going to go to Nika Lewis from CVM TV. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so I have a few questions. Just the same. Not sure why I'm echoing. Minister, today several persons called our newsroom complaining about their disappointment in being turned away from the St. Joseph's Hospital, where they went and after filing their appointment to get their vaccination today. They were told allegedly that there were no vaccines available to complete the process today for them. Are you aware of this situation and what would you say could have occasioned what happened? I'm not aware of the situation, Nika, and I, the clinicians here are not either. Um, what I will say, what the policy is, it would be unacceptable for us. I don't know what time it is, so I'll give the, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming here now, if it was past the period of time and therefore what they projected had been used up and so on. But normally how it works is that we anticipate uh, take up uh, by appointments and there is some room for walk-ins and uh, there is our, our, an arrangement or provisions for persons to to add additional supplies i mean in kingston it's very easy the nhf is the substantial logistics hub for vaccines so i would need to check to see exactly why that was the case um it may have been personal related i don't know um but ideally we do want to have vaccines on request, particularly now that we want the numbers to go up. And so we will have to correct that if that was in fact the case, and we need to find out why. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Minister. We're going to go to Janet Silvera from the Gleaner. Thank you very much, Stephen. My questions are, will you engage the private physicians to care for non-COVID patients so that public health um, personnel can focus on vaccination? That's number one. Would your ministry be 
able to assist the private sector, the doctors in the private sector rather, with tax exemption on PPEs and medication used to vaccinate persons, not, sorry, not, not to vaccinate persons, to treat COVID-19 patients. And the third and final question is, how do we plan to store the Pfizer vaccines? The, the clinical question around <clears throat> private doctors treating non-COVID patients to create space for COVID patients. So our non-COVID patients in our primary care centers are treated in our curative or treatment clinics and in our chronic disease clinics. Um, these clinics are manned by physicians um, or family nurse practitioners. In terms of the personnel that is utilized in the vaccination sites. These are mostly our public health nurses. We do have or some of our doctors being utilized in terms of the, the observation and emergency response. But for the most part, our curative clinics, our treatment clinics, um, our chronic diseases clinics, and our communicable diseases clinics, those are still um, functioning and are, are being carried out as usual in terms of the routine schedule. We do recognize, however, though, that in Jamaica, a significant part of the management of patients for outside of COVID is carried out by the private sector. And so the private sector physicians continue to play a major part as they have always done in the management of acute and chronic diseases in patients. Uh, the, the, the other question about the Pfizer vaccine, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Ennis to just address that, please. So the Pfizer vaccine is stored or can be stored at three different temperatures, uh, at minus 70, which is the ultra cold temperature, and storage at that rate is uh, for about six months. It can also be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius for 14 days and between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius for uh, up to 31 days. So we do have capacity within the Ministry of Health and Wellness for storage of between 2 to 8 and minus 20. We have collaborated with the private sector in accessing minus 70 storage for the Pfizer uh, vaccine. So we do have adequate storage space for what we will be receiving and we have looked at the logistics of how it can be transported and the efficacy of the vaccine maintained. Right, and your third question around tax exemption, I think you said it's for private doctors, um, for them to uh, be able to supply medication and so on for patients. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a tax man. <laughs> Uh, as the Ministry of Finance, of course, the, the Cabinet considers these things and decisions are taken. Uh, to date, I think the government has done a fair job in providing the medication that is required, both to treat as well as the, the, the PPEs and all of what, you know, what is required. I think the NHF has benefited substantially from budgets and review, revised budgets coming from the government through the Ministry of Finance. Um, you know, one could interpret that as an important decision that could is far better than any tax exemption. So, you know, it, it depends on how you look at it. But, but I don't think the government has to date, and, and I uh, clearly part of the executive arm, but I think the prime minister and the team have to be credited for this. We have not been stingy on the approach to expenditure around the COVID response because we have recognized the importance of getting back to normal as quickly as possible. And that applies to medication, PPEs, and everything else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Same, we're going to go to Christopher Thomas from the Gleaner. Thank you. 
Yes, good evening, uh, Minister, and to your team. Uh, you mentioned, as it relates to the, the vaccination for children and getting parental consent for that once that becomes available. But my question is, what if when you approach these parents to get their consent for their children, including school-age children for vaccination, what if those parents do not give that consent for whatever reason because they have their own personal view on, on vaccination for whatever, whatever cause or reason? Um, is there going to be any risk that um, either the parents or the, or the child might get some kind of sanction? And I ask that in light of uh, the report that was given out today, that was pu um, publicized today rather, that the JDF had said that administrative consequences are coming for their members, their soldiers who do not take the vaccine. And plus you yourself had previously said in a previous COVID conversation that there may be differ different protocols that would have to come into play for persons who knowingly do not take the vaccine. I'm going to ask Dr. Ennis to comment on the policy around administering vaccines to minors because there is a general policy which is used and it would be the same for COVID. So just to remind us of that and then I can comment on the other part of the question. Dr. Ennis. So for childhood vaccinations, we do have the laws that are for us and guide us and it is mandatory for children up to the age of seven to receive the antigens that are offered in country. Now, the consent that we seek from parents can be termed as a soft consent. It's not a written consent. It's once you present to a facility, present to your private practitioner, present wherever vaccines are being offered, and you will be inoculated. And that has been the tradition in country. Most of us don't even know that we actually have the law and that persons are prohibited from entering school, primary school, if they're, or basic school for that matter, if they're not inoculated. Now, these vaccines, as we go through the life course, so we have moved from vaccinating just children and going along adolescents, adults, uh, they're not mandatory. However, the importance of getting vaccinated, the fact that a lot of our children do have underlying conditions and this vaccine will help or prevent them from becoming severely ill, we are confident that uh, parents will agree and come along with their children to be vaccinated. We have targeted specific groups and those will become known as we uh, roll out the Pfizer vaccine administration. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ennis. And so in regards to the issue of, of uh, mandating vaccine take-up, the, the issue has been quite controversial, um, uh, not just in Jamaica, but in the region. Indeed, we've seen in recent days uh, protests in some countries, some of our Caribbean con um, colleagues, as well as in the wider uh, world, and certainly a raging debate um, by uh, some around this this concept. The, the Honourable Prime Minister has been clear, uh, it's an issue that has been discussed, that the, there is no intention at this point in time to mandate by legislation vaccines um, on the population. And, and I think that is worth reiterating. The, the, what I will say, however, uh, and, and this is qualitatively, uh, uh, there's a difference, and this is what I've been saying, that there is going to come a point, if take-up is low, where we have to accept that those persons who refuse to take the vaccine as it is their right so to do, because based on what the policy is, that they are also, they recognize that they represent 
a greater risk both to themselves and to others they come in contact with when compared to persons who have opted to take the vaccine. And so if you have a scenario where a risk assessment means some persons are posing a greater threat to themselves, but very importantly to others, not just to themselves, then you will see policy changes, not just not necessarily policy changes at the level of government, at the level of organizations. Um, and it's happening at parts in the world, you know, where employers are saying, listen, if you don't have the vaccine, I'm sorry, I, I have to look at whether you can enter my restaurant, for example. Um, you know, um, you know, even employment issues are being discussed, and I know this will become further for, you know, worker representation and the discussion around the right to choose and so on. But, but it is becoming and has become a discussion point globally. And governments have mandated certain uh, working groups within the public service to take the vaccine as part of their duty. Um, based on the type of work that they have done. So I, I mean, I personally, I, I think it's unfortunate, but I recognize the right of persons to protest. Clearly we condemn the violence that has been inflicted in one case on a prime minister. And one does not have to break the law to express one's view. And, and I think persons should be allowed to express their views. Um, but at the same time, I should be allowed to express mine and others who support vaccines and vaccine take up and the benefits of vaccines without being threatened, abused, or even done harm. So, you know, we, we, we will have to continue to make that case because I do believe that the vaccines represent a safe way to protect ourselves and the society and that those who are advocating otherwise um, you know, I, I believe that we're, we're on the right side of history. I certainly believe so, and I think the science supports it. Thank you very much, Minister. We're going to go to Corey Robinson from the Gleaner. Good night, Minister and Representatives. Corey Robinson, Sunday Gleaner. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say condolences to the family of the nurse who who died, and that's where we, I wanted to start with two quick, quick questions. The first question is, how many healthcare workers have died from COVID-19 in Jamaica so far? How many have been vaccinated thus far? And do you think, Minister, should it be mandatory for healthcare workers, the frontline workers battling COVID, to be vaccinated? And the second question, uh, one that is very popular on the ground among my readers, is in regards to, we've, we've heard that persons with COVID-19 ought not to be vaccinated while they're, well, they're infected. Uh, that, that, that's the understanding. Is there mechanisms at these vaccination points that will test if persons are indeed infected with COVID-19 vaccine? Thank you uh, very much. the CMO to, to respond to that, Corey. Right. Just want to, to respond to the, the last sec sec section of your questions. Um, so first of all, the, the vaccine itself contains no live virus. So the vaccine cannot give you COVID. Um, there, there is there's no, no, nothing that has said that if you have COVID and you get the vaccine, that it will worsen your COVID outcome, okay? What happens though is that for persons who are ill, who have COVID, who are ill, then you would want them to recover from that illness and to be, have, to be symptom free before you give them the vaccine. So the, the recommendation is that those persons that are confirmed positive, that are ill should wait until their symptoms resolve. They have completed their 14 days of isolation and then they can get the vaccine. So th there is nothing to prevent somebody who is 
asymptomatic who probably may think that they, they, they are right nowhere in community, a community spread. So there may be a lot of persons who are walking around who don't know if they have COVID. They don't have any symptoms. They have not been tested. There is no issue with these persons getting the vaccine. So we encourage persons to come out and take the vaccine. However, if you are ill, please wait until your symptoms have subsided. If it is that you think that this may be COVID or your symptoms are not going away, then get tested. And after your isolation period is finished, then come and take the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, there was a question about healthcare workers vaccinated and have died. I don't have that data. Do you have that? So our last just about sixty-five percent of the pool of healthcare workers. Uh, and forty forty plus percent would have received the second dose. A few of our healthcare workers are not eligible as yet and will become so later on this. Uh, month, but we are at about 65% of our healthcare workers. Thank you very much. We're going to go to Stevie and Simmons from Nationwide. No, man, in regards to the Prime Minister, should healthcare work workers be, be vaccinated, mandatory to be vaccinated? Minister. I just, uh, I, I just indicated the policy of the government as articulated by the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, that there is currently no mandatory arrangements or policy or, uh, in place for any category of worker. We do encourage our workers and those on the front line in particular, they were prioritized when we first got vaccines, to take the vaccine as part of their own protection and their risk profile. But um, the government has not put in place any mandatory or are not, we're not discussing that at this point in time. Thank you. Stevie Ann, we're going to go to you now. Hi, good evening. Um, I just want to ask, can you hear me? Go ahead, please. Okay. I just want to ask the minister, how soon, and if you can give an exit, an exact date now, how soon will, be, will we be getting that machine that can test for the Delta and other variants? Right. Um, um, I don't have a date, but I recall seeing a message sent to me by the head of our lab today. The uh, CDC um, have not given any exact timeline for procurement. They're working, the CDC, of course, Centers for Disease Control. They're working with the Pan American Health Organization on the preparation of budget for release of funds. Um, but it will be sometime during the course of the next few months. Um, and there's also another two other possibilities that are being pursued. So, so as I had explained, it's not if it were just a shelf item that we go and take off the shelf we would have had the machine already. The truth is it has to be manufactured and uh, there, that process is in train. And um, we, in a sense, we have to await that process to be completed. It's, it's, not, it's not just an issue of the money, by the way. It's also an issue of, of, of accessing and, and making the arrangement and the process that is involved. So what we have done is put in place an alternative arrangement, as we had said, three locations where we send samples for testing. But even in that process, it's not a 24-hour sample turnaround because the genome, genome sequencing process apparently takes a while. So we send out weekly or every other week, and we await their time to send back. I don't know when, when, when if we have gotten any recently. CMO, are we um, any... 
said, well, we got the results of the 200 that we had sent. Right. But we haven't gotten any results. Right. So we, we, we have to depend on others in this instance to, to provide for us the information. To hedge against that kind of uncertainty, however, we are on record very clear to say we should assume that the Delta virus exists here in Jamaica and that the pace of spread and the extent of hospitalization and so on does suggest that. And it's logical because it is or has become the dominant uh, variant in countries that are interacting with us very closely, given our borders being open to those countries, those environments. The UK, I mean, it's, it's the dominant variant now, I think, in the UK. Um, the US, um, and let's face it, you know, we, we're getting thousands coming in and going out every day, so it would be almost foolhardy to assume or to, to, to think that somehow we are going to benefit from a sort of intervention that is unseen. Once you have that kind of interaction, it is highly likely, and therefore we should act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go to Cassius Watson from Jamaica Social. Can you hear me? Good evening, folks. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Minister, as you just mentioned, it, it seems like Jamaica will be flooded almost with thousands of vaccines over the next few months. Um, but the rate of vaccination is pretty low. What, what, what will be the contingency? And um, when it comes to length, maybe your vaccination specialist can tell us uh, what's the longest period these vaccines will be kept or can be kept for, and if they're not used, what, what then happens? Do we give them away or are they damaged? I noticed in Africa, a country recently had to, you know, destroy thousands of vaccines. That's one question. The other is, um, there has been mention of younger people um, coming into the hospital. Um, and I understand it was also um, um, said that, uh, this could mean that the Delta variant is here. Um, this, the CMO, when is the next batch of results expected um, for us to hear where Delta is concerned? And, and are you, final question, um, seeing anyone or hearing of incidences, um, incidents where persons when in really serious illness, COVID, COVID illness, being, being asking for the vaccine at a late stage what 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 do you what have you heard where that's concerned thank you so i'm gonna ask the same to address the issue of the um second part of that question but to, just to say that the issue of dumping of vaccines is not um it's 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 no longer a novel concept because the truth is and as tragic as it is, there are parts of the world where there is significant excess stored vaccines not being taken up with expiration dates that are close or would have been uh, achieved and or reached. And as a consequence, vaccines would have had to be discarded or dumped or destroyed. Our principle, to be very clear, is that we're not going to administer any vaccine to Jamaicans that would have passed the expiration date. Um, and therefore, no Jamaican should be worried or concerned about that. We therefore, when we receive vaccines, we note the date of expiration and we utilize up to that point, after which, if there is no take up, then those vaccines are not going to be given to anyone, any other country or anyone else, or locally. They'll be discarded, they'll be destroyed. And we do expect and anticipate that some of the vaccines that we have now and in the future would have to be destroyed. Because truth, the truth is, the vaccine, the, the, the approach to sourcing vaccine to date has been a combination of diplomacy and 
procurement or purchase. Uh, this, this is a classic case of having a lot of money doesn't necessarily guarantee your strength in the market because Jamaica has never complained about a lack of or a, a, a inability to afford the vaccine if we could get it. The, the strength in this arrangement has been where the manufacturers are located, who they are more affiliated to, and the larger, more powerful countries where these manufacturers are, are, are to some extent guided, guide the process and they secure amounts that are well beyond their populations and they administer to their population to alleviate the threat that they see to themselves. And then to the extent that they can, they extend uh, offers to others, other countries and we have been beneficiaries of that. Now, we're very grateful for the, that generosity of spirit, but it comes with limitations because sometimes it comes with expiration dates that are close or closer than we would like, but we would rather attempt to administer than not to have the vaccines. And this is not to devalue in any way the friendship, the relationship, and the benefits that we have derived. We are very happy and very grateful. And we have benefited from a number of countries, as you know. But it does, because of the, 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 the limitation of, 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 not being able, of, of not being able to access, even though we have funds, which is why Minister Johnson Smith is such, so critical to the process, the Prime Minister, supported, of course, by us. Uh, the Johnson Johnson, however, was a negotiated arrangement. And so we will get those vaccines with the maximum time for usage before they expire. And normally that's what? Is it three months? Four months? Six months. Six months, Six months for the J&J. &J. So we're buying this, so we will get time to use, or more time. Some of the gifts that we have had, we have had those that expiration period cut in half, three months in, in one case as you know we had a week and we days. had to deliver what seven days days, days. and we delivered eighty three thousand doses in what four or five days because we did not want to exceed the expiration date so you know it 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 to understand why we are in the position we are in give me any particular uh vaccine batch is a function of how the vaccine is acquired and uh, we adjust our strategy to deal with the population while still holding very firm to the to, to ensuring the efficacy of the vaccines and uh, there will come a point when we will have to dump some of the vaccines for all of these reasons including hesitancy which is why we want Jamaicans to take up once they have the offer as quickly as possible um, I don't remember what the other question was, but I know it wasn't for me. Was did you answer it? Oh, really? Okay. Oh Lord. All right, thank you very much. We actually have three more new hands and two follow ups. We're gonna go to Zara Burton. Good evening everybody. My questions are related to well, the new website that the minister just spoke about. Uh, we talk a lot about science and being led by the science. And the science has shown that there is a plausible link with blood clots and low platelets with the AstraZeneca and the G&G. Gain Barron syndrome was in the news recently, I think possibly linked to G&G. We have pericarditis, pericarditis and myocarditis linked to Pfizer. Um, and Moderna, we're getting JJ, AstraZeneca, of course, is already here, Pfizer. Now, and j, &J I think, has been administered. Now, on this website that is being put out, right, even though you're being led by the science, there is a part that talks about side effects. And I'll read the first line. It says side effects are mild to moderate and temporary. Now, for instance, the blood clots with low platelets, we know it's rare. But why is the government not being careful to fully inform the population about these very rare but 
serious side effects. Yes, there's anaphylaxis mentioned in a different section of the website I saw. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not seeing these serious side effects mentioned, but even when it comes to brochures, when the FDA and the WHO give their brochures on AstraZeneca, they're very careful to give these more serious side effects, and yet we continue to say just the mild and temporary ones. Why is that, and are you potentially opening up taxpayers to lawsuits that could be effective if it is that we continue to omit this kind of more serious information from the information pamphlets that are going out. So that's question one. Question two, Dr. Ennis mentioned a while ago that the law mandates vaccines, I think for up to seven years, because the Pfizer is approved for 12 and over. Is this law now applicable given the age difference? That's two. Three. Yesterday there was a session by some doctors here in Jamaica. It was on Zoom regarding early treatment of COVID-19 and their take, several of them, was that if you get COVID-19, the thing to do is to treat early rather than just wait and isolate at home. They were encouraging the ministry to is willing to consider that kind of guidance from these doctors that presented yesterday. And I think I have one more, but I don't know if I'm allowed. Let me please if I'm allowed. So one of the things mentioned as well is people are contracting COVID-19. There was an article in the paper, I don't know if it was Observer or Vina yesterday. No, it's not clear in the article. She got it from the hospital. But I've been hearing about cases where people are acquiring COVID-19 from hospitals after going in for something else regardless of vaccination status. They're going for a procedure to come up with COVID-19. What is the government doing to arrest that incidence if it is that you are in fact seeing it? Thank you for entertaining. All right, well, a lot of courtesy. to see um, what I remember and how best I can supply an answer. Um, so first, the first um, thing you mentioned was with regards to um, the the documentation of the of the side effects, even though rare, um, yes, we do acknowledge that some very rare um, effects have been um, have been uh, documented, and so I do take your point that um, we can publicize these, and I think that um, it it would be good if we link we we can provide a link to the actual. Um, product information on our website. It is there already? Okay. So so I am advised that the link is already there for the product information. Um, I, I will verify it myself and, and look to ensure that um, all of those possible side effects are there. But I, I really do want to encourage persons that, you know, just a reminder um, that the side effects, the, 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 the really bad side effects, the adverse effects are quite rare. Yes, you, you should know about it. And we encourage um, persons who have illnesses to discuss with the persons administering the vaccine. We have an information session before persons get the vaccine so that they are able to ask questions. I know that I have passed through the vaccination centers and persons have asked me questions. Um, that's what we're there for. So, you know, if you have questions, you have doubts in your minds, um, we are there. Persons are on the ground who can provide some of the answers um, to you, you know, to help to point out that there may be effects, but, you know, these are rare. But it is on the website, I'm assured, and there is a link that persons can look up those others. But the vaccines are fairly, pretty much, for the large part, safe, very, very rare side effects. So I really want to encourage persons, and even for those persons who 
who are ill, who have all the persons with chronic illnesses, then the, the outcome of severe COVID is worse here. So it is better to take the vaccine. I, I believe there was a question regarding uh, the legislation being extended to from seven years to 12. No, it is not going to happen at this point. That would certainly require dialogue and change in the law. It is up to seven and beyond that, it is not mandatory. And we just ask kindly for persons to look and weigh the benefits and the risk and so get their children vaccinated. Um, in, with relation to the, the question about persons going into hospital and contracting COVID, um, I just want to remind everyone again that we are in community spread. And so therefore you can, just stepping out of your house, and nowadays you can um you can catch covid and so we we have to all you know maintain the precautions at all times um the incubation period is 0 to 14 days and it is really difficult to ascertain where it is that persons will pick up covid uh the the reality is that you can know and everybody needs to take precautions but it is going to really be difficult to say where it is that you catch you catch COVID, and there is a possibility that you can catch it everywhere. Thank you very much. See, I'm going to go to Debbie and Wright from RJR. Good evening. I'm sorry about that. Good evening. Um. For vaccinated people who have been hospitalized, what's the extent of their illness? Is um, anybody seriously ill? Also, secondly, is that there any consideration to rehiring some of the doctors whose contracts had expired earlier this um, year, given the current crunch? In terms of... In terms of persons that have been have been vaccinated, that um, end up in hospital, so so far we have had reports of two persons. Um, anecdotally, you may have heard of more, but we have gotten official reports of two persons. One person that was had received one dose, and another person that was fully vaccinated. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that um, the, the efficacy studies have, have shown that there is almost 100% um, protection against severe COVID and hospitalizations. In terms of actual effectiveness, um, the recent WHO report has shown that there is approximately over 80% effectiveness against severe COVID. So we do recognize that there are some people, few persons that may be fully vaccinated that can get severe COVID and have hospitalizations, but the effectiveness and the efficacy studies are quite high in preventing severe COVID and hospitalizations. In terms of preventing mild COVID, then it is it is a bit less what the effectiveness studies are sh are showing the effectiveness reports are showing is that there is a 60% um chance there's a 60% protective effectiveness against mild covid so we do know that there are many persons who even though they're vaccinated will have covid but this will be a mild disease and this can be treated more than likely at home and they don't have to be hospitalized. But importantly to note is that persons who have been vaccinated can also transmit, even if they have no symptoms that they can transmit. And that is why we still recommend that persons having had vaccination 
they should still continue to adhere to all the precautions and to ensure that the vulnerable among them are vaccinated and are protected. Can I just say, as, as part of the response, quickly, that the, 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 the issues around the nature of illness should also, I think, reflect a position on the, the age cohorts, the categories of persons, age cohorts in hospital. Um, and I just want to make it clear that none of us are immune, uh, whether we are young, uh, however you define young, um, or older, or middle-aged, because we have seen in the statistics persons below 20, below 30, below 40, below 50, and of course above, not only being hospitalized, but in some instances dying from the COVID virus or complications from the virus. So it's very important that now that we have opened the process to all, uh, that you use the opportunity because you can also, and you are at risk um, from overexposure and from not taking the vaccine or taking the other precautions that are necessary. On the issue of the nurses and the engagement of those who were not uh, engaged after they, they served their um, like house officer uh, process. Doctors. doctors, sorry, doctors, not nurses. Um, we, we, we have taken note of the challenges that we're facing. We have had some discussions internally, and there is some consideration being given to uh, an, an offer to engage those doctors in a specific role and and we want to be very clear on that um, because there is still the challenge of the organization the structure of the organization and the posts that are available and reconciling that with the numbers that are coming out of the of medical school which we're looking at as a more longer term plan uh, as to recasting how we structure public health but the immediacy of the challenge around the third wave and the, the, the challenges around the vaccination effort in particular is causing us to look at a particular role that would be an offer to those doctors and, in, and that role would be around the vaccination effort uh, for a period of time. Um, I think we're still refining that and I'd leave that to the CMO and her team and the PS to advance some more specific, more specific details around that. But it is something that we have discussed and we think there is some value that could be created there as we seek to push vaccination. More will be said on that in the days to come. Thank you, Minister. I'm gonna to go to Emma Lewis. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to go back to something Dr. Ennis said about um, vaccination of healthcare workers. Um, did you say that 65% have received the first dose only and uh, less than half are vaccinated or fully vaccinated? I, I didn't quite get that. Um, and, and I also wanted to clarify something on the genome sequencing. Have we have we got any updates on results? Have any results come back with the Delta variant? And also, um, finally, well, this was my main question, really, um, regarding the transmission of um, COVID-19 through the air. Um, and we talk a lot about sanitization, but I'm not hearing much about workplaces with full air conditioning, circulating restaurants and that kind of thing, and whether there's any guidance or recommendations for workplaces on on the air circulation. So those are my questions. Just a couple of little clarifications on that main question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss Lewis. Uh, it is approximately 65% of the healthcare workers that would have received their first dose and uh, in some areas, we are up to 80% that have received the second dose, but on average, we are closer to about 55%. Uh, 
uh, of persons who would have received their second dose at this time. Being mindful that not all persons are eligible as yet, we continue to vaccinate into September to meet the 8 to 12 week interval that uh, those healthcare workers would have had. And to date, we have not had any confirmation of the Delta virus in country, but we are looking at the situation and possibly thinking that it may be here, but there is no confirmation at this time. Thank you very much. We're going to close now with the two follow-ups. I'm going to ask Damien Mitchell to go ahead. Oh, Stephen, hello. Hello, Stephen. Yes, Emma. Um, you didn't answer my question on on the air circulation and transmission of of the, of the virus. Sorry. So for workplace protocols, um, those would have been have been um, circulated now for some time. They are available on our website that you can you can have a look at them. And it is looking at precautions in terms of droplets and aerosol um, production. So the, the protocols in terms of the wearing of the mask, the sanitization of the surfaces, as well as your hands, the physical distancing, those are all key parts of the prevention of transmission in workplaces. And this is available on our website under the workplace protocols. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Damien. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Damien, I was before you. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. My follow -up. Thank you. Um, this is to Stamo. She had responded to the question about using private doctors in the place of um, hospitals that are now overwhelmed and clinics where the doctors are also overwhelmed. The minister had said that with, through, with the vaccine blitz, regular care at clinics may be interrupted. But I noticed that you're saying that that is not happening. One, two, patients are being asked at hospitals to buy meds. I got that information yesterday at a press conference that was held by doctors. Some are spending millions of dollars just to stay alive in some of the public hospitals, and that is why they're asking for meds, they're asking for exemption on certain medication. And finally, um, early treatment, which I heard Zara ask about just no was not answered. I had that same question that I wanted to find out from you because the doctors are asking for some type of collaboration where that is concerned because they believe that with early treatment, far less people would be dying. In terms of medications that persons have to purchase, um, certainly if, if there are medications that are not on our VEN list and that are required, then um, the prescription would be purchased outside of the hospital. So on, in our system, while a significant number of medications are on our, our list, um, which we call our VEN list, vital essential, and what the end stands for? Yeah. Vital, vital essential drug list. Um, those, those items are provided in the public sector. Um, we also have a considerable amount of other medication that is subsidized through the NHF. Um, so outside of those, then persons would have to procure medication. In terms of the, the early treatment um, for COVID, um, certainly... Uh, Test 
hydrate. Um, some persons would recommend um, vitamins, um, treatment of symptoms such as fever, uh, any kind of upper respiratory symptoms. Those are all, all important, but there is no definitive treatment, curative treatment for COVID. Thank you very much, CMO. Damien? Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, CMO, can you explain the reduction in daily testing for the past seven or so days while the infections have been increasing? That, that's question one. And also, can you explain the reason for the delay in receiving those results of the samples you had sent for the Delta variant? Um, Damien, I am not sure about the reduction in testing because we we have been testing um, between uh, close to a thousand tests per day. Um, what I can say to you is that we have increased significantly in our public hospital sites the antigen testing that is done. Um, you don't you won't see it in the numbers because we only report the positives um, for the public antigen testing. But all our sites that we have, our regional facilities, have increased significantly that testing. And why, why the negatives are not reported is because they're all repeated. Um, PCR is done for them. So a significant number of antigen tested. And we're also increasing that capacity through our collaboration with PAHO that have donated additional machines and even more antigen tests that will be utilized in the public sector. So we intend to get up at least another five to six sites within the public sector that is doing this. But the more we do the antigen test is the less you will see the PCR test because the positives are not going to be repeated and you're not going to see the number of negatives. But our testing have, have not really decreased um, we are doing more testing, but remember also that our testing is based on our testing protocols. We test all suspected cases, all cases of um, respiratory illnesses, and of course, through our contact tracing and case investigation, we test, and also in terms of our hospital admissions, we test as well. All right. Thank you very much to our media colleagues. I'm going to hand now to Minister to give his closing remarks. Okay, so it's, it's been a really long evening. Um, a lot has been said, so it's not for me to continue the, the, to prolong the process. Just to remind our listeners, viewers, uh, the population that uh, we are in a third wave. Our public health infrastructure is under stress, and we are really trying to to manage that process, we continue to urge patients for um, non-essential services uh, and to those who need the help because of essential emergency services, whether COVID or otherwise, we're doing the best that we can. We, we celebrate and salute and encourage our healthcare workers. We have a major vaccine initiative going uh, we do have a plan, contrary to what some may suggest. That, that plan is in effect. It's now moving from blitz and fixed sites to include community activations. It involves all of society approach, critical stakeholder groups, and uh, there is uh, a standard operating procedure that is being implemented to support the build out. We have vaccines and we'll be getting more vaccines. And so it is up to us, to the country, to take advantage of those vaccines, which we certainly encourage. Thank you very much. We will continue to keep in touch. Let us work together to build uh, the desirable result of restoring our country to normality and saving lives uh, against the coronavirus and its impact. Thank you. Have a good evening. So far we are coping, but we kind of train the resources as in PPE, the guns, the gloves, you know, for instance, those stuff, the kind of running low. There has been roughly the same